We're about to begin a unit on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is both an intrinsically fascinating and highly informative mode of spectroscopy that tells us about the electronic environments of hydrogens and carbons and molecules, and how they're connected to each other, which is highly valuable information for determining structure. To really understand how to interpret NMR spectra, though, we need a pretty detailed understanding of what's going on at the microscopic physical level when we run an NMR spectrum. So we're going to start with the physical principles of NMR, delving into things like what dictates where an NMR signal appears and what coupling amounts to physically. And then we'll transition into talking about how to use NMR spectra to elucidate the structures of organic molecules. The magic of NMR spectroscopy comes from the fact that certain types of nuclei behave as if they have an intrinsic property called spin. And what spin leads to is a situation in which the nucleus itself has what's called a magnetic moment, which we can think of as a magnetic analog of a dipole moment, negative and positive charges separated in space. A magnetic dipole corresponds to the north and south of a traditional magnet separated in space. When nuclear spins are placed in a magnetic field, interesting things happen. And when we measure what happens, that's an NMR experiment. Luckily for organic chemists, many of the nuclei that do respond to magnetic fields, in other words, have meaningful spins, are nuclei of interest to organic chemists, such as the proton itself, a hydrogen-1 nucleus, carbon-13, which is uh, not very abundant, but very important from an NMR perspective, nucleus of carbon, and even isotopes like fluorine-19 and phosphorus-31, which give us some insight into heteroatomic behavior. These nuclei act like tiny magnets in a magnetic field. In this and future videos, we're going to call this external magnetic field that we apply using a very strong magnet, B0. And because the nuclei act like they're spinning, this isn't exactly what happens, but it's a nice analogy that we can draw, they have a magnetic dipole moment that tends to align with or against the field. So in the absence of a magnetic field, these dipoles are distributed randomly. When we apply the field, there's a tendency of the nuclei to either align with the field or against it. Notice here that the applied field, which is in the background in lighter color, has the northern end at the top and the southern end at the bottom. Most of the nuclear magnetic moments are aligned this way, with the red end pointed up towards the northern side of B0. A few of them, here I've represented just one, are oriented in the opposite direction. And these orientations suggest an energy difference between the red up and blue up orientations, if you will. Because the parallel spin state, which has the northern end of each magnetic moment pointed toward the northern end of B0, is lower in energy than the anti-parallel arrangement, which has the southern end of the magnetic moment pointed towards the northern end of B0. Here's a representation of that. There are many more nuclei aligned this way than there are this way. And this energy difference is relatively small. That's one of the remarkable things about magnetic resonance. It's a very tiny effect in an energetic sense, but it's still large enough to bias the nuclei to most of them, greater than 99%, being aligned with the external field in the parallel arrangement. This energy difference is so small that we find it in the radio frequency region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And delta E, as it turns out, is affected by the electronic environment of the nucleus because electrons themselves have magnetic moments as well. And so the essence of NMR really, for our purposes, involves measuring this delta E value for different types of nuclei using radio waves. The most important nucleus for this purpose is, without question, the proton, the hydrogen-1 nucleus, which is, of course, ubiquitous in organic molecules. In addition to depending on the electronic environment of the nucleus, an effect that we'll get into in a lot more detail later, the delta E depends also on the strength of the applied magnetic field, on the size of B0, in other words. As we move to the right, along the x-axis on this graph, we're increasing the strength of the magnetic field, and as we can see here, the energy gap between the parallel and anti-parallel spin states increases linearly. Larger separation is good here because it makes it easier to see small changes due to, for example, changes in electronic environment. And thankfully, the proton is among the most sensitive nuclei when it comes to magnetic resonance. If we were to look, for example, at the splitting for carbon-13 rather than hydrogen-1, the separation here would still increase as B0 increased, but it would do so a lot more slowly 
since carbon is a lot less intrinsically sensitive than the proton is. If we think about a sample of, for example, a mole of protons sitting here at the center of these coordinate axes, we've got a mole's worth of these magnetic moment vectors, the vast majority of them pointing upwards when the applied magnetic field is pointing in this direction, and a few pointing in the opposite direction. It's inconvenient and difficult to think about all of these magnetic moment vectors, and an equivalent approach that turns out to be a lot easier to, to think about and understand involves adding them all together and looking at the resulting vector of all that addition. That gives us the so-called magnetization vector, capital M. This gives us a sense of the direction in which the magnetic moments are pointing in general. And it's important for NMR for reasons we'll see here in a second. At equilibrium, because more of the spins are aligned up than down, the magnetization vector points along the direction of the magnetic field, and that's what we're seeing here. However, because the energy difference between the up and down spin states corresponds to the radio wave region of the spectrum, we can apply radio frequency light to the sample to cause the magnetization vector to change its position. For example, we can rotate it in this direction. When we do this, something interesting happens, and I want to show you how this looks in a simulation. If we apply a pulse of radio frequency light to the sample, the magnetization vector actually rotates off of the z-axis, which corresponds to some components in the x and y direction that are quantum mechanical in nature that we don't have to worry about too much. What we're looking at here is frozen in time. If we observe what happens with time running, we find that the magnetization vector actually rotates around the applied field, like you're seeing here. Remember that B0, as we've drawn it so far, points vertically in the Z direction. That frequency of rotation of the magnetization vector around the applied magnetic field vector is the frequency that corresponds to the energy difference between the up and down spin states. And that frequency is affected, again, by the magnetic field strength, and we'll see an analogy for this in just a second, and the chemical environment of the proton. Acquiring an NMR spectrum involves measuring this frequency by looking at the time domain and translating this into a frequency spectrum. In other words, figuring out through some fancy mathematics that's not too fancy, that we'll talk about a little bit later, the frequency of these oscillations in the time domain. This may all seem very abstract and weird, and it absolutely is, and so I want to use an analogy to help you better understand how NMR works. This analogy is based on the notion that the proton and any other magnetically active nucleus can be thought of as a compass needle, and the proton behaves the same way a compass needle does, more or less, in the presence of an external magnetic field. The simulation that you see here has north and south poles above and below the compass needle. And of course, at equilibrium, the compass needle is aligned so that its opposite pole points toward each end of the applied magnetic field. This is what we would expect from magnet in general anyway, right? We can tip the compass needle if we apply a magnetic field at right angles to it. But in general, we don't see much tipping unless we oscillate that magnetic field at just the right frequency to encourage it to tip. This is a lot like swinging a child on a swing. Pushing the child at just the right moment leads to enhancement of the oscillations, right? If we oscillate at a different frequency, then what we'll find is that the compass needle quickly returns to equilibrium and doesn't really do too much in terms of its oscillations, and this is true even if we turn up the magnetic field somewhat. The applied perpendicular field isn't oscillating at the right frequency to encourage the compass needle to rock back and forth at a high amplitude. At the right frequency, though, we can get it to oscillate at high amplitude. And this condition, where the oscillating field is going back and forth at the natural frequency that the compass needle wants to rock back and forth at, is known as magnetic resonance. And it's highly analogous to what happens in an NMR experiment. The radio waves that are applied to the sample at right angles to B0 are analogous to this magnet oscillating back and forth. Of course, we can't achieve this in an actual experiment because the frequency of oscillation is far too rapid to use an actual magnet to do this, but keeping in mind that there's a component of electromagnetic radiation that is magnetic in nature that oscillates back and forth, this oscillating magne magnetic field is doing exactly what this magnet moving back and forth is doing. In an actual NMR experiment, we use a coil 
rather than a magnet to apply this radio frequency radiation. And as soon as we turn off this magnetic field at right angles, which is called B1 in the NMR literature and in this simulation, we can measure the signal given off. And this looks exactly like that signal we just saw in the simulation. It's an oscillating sine wave that decays over time as the compass needle, or as the hydrogen nucleus, as the case may be, returns to equilibrium.